Thank you all very much for coming out this evening. Um, this is our our new home for now. We'll see how this pans out. The wonderful Bray's basement. Thank you very much for venturing your way down the vicarious stairs to be here. We have um, a double bill of speakers tonight, which is a break from our normal format. But what we'll do is we'll have the, the talks from both speakers and then allow uh, a few opportunities to recharge your glasses uh, and we'll have an open discussion, the same way that we normally do. So all we'll do is run two talks back to back. I believe Susan, you're going to go first. Just so, introduce right. so we have two speakers. Our first speaker will be Susan Gullick, who is um, a self-proclaimed skeptic junkie, I think is the way it was described, wasn't it? And it pioneers the use of a variety of sort of online tools to, to, as a skeptic activist, really. And um, I'm sure I don't want to give too much away from what Susan's going to talk about. I don't, I don't know exactly what Susan's going to be talking about, but that's great. Um, Susan will know and give some insights into how she's uh, expanded uh, dealing with skepticism beyond just the choir, which to a certain extent I think we are, really. Skeptics in the pub event. Our next speaker after that will be Mark Edward, who had uh, 30 years' experience of being a mentalist, um, which I think, in Scottish parlance to me, when you call someone a mentalist for 30 years, <laughs> maybe has a slightly different connotation. I'm sure he's okay. Um, and, uh, I'm okay. Mark's <laughs> Mark has informed me that he's quite happy to give his own introduction in more detail later on, so I won't spoil too much of what Mark's been involved in, but some of you have maybe read the description of the talk will have some idea of some of the fantastic things that Mark's involved in. But I think we'll move straight on to Susan to leave the first talk for today, or do you want to try the video again first? No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Yay, Susan! Yay, Susan. Yay. Gerbic, all the way from California. So if you're having problems with my accent, I apologize, but I will try to speak so that you can understand me and project my, my voice out there. So Mark and I were at QED. We were hired to come and speak at QED this last um, couple weeks ago, and we decided that uh, we wanted to see Scotland. So we decided we were just going to come up here, and I'm so grateful you guys asked for us to come and speak to you here in Dundee because we would, you know, not come to Dundee without it. <laughs> but we really appreciate it because we're seeing Scotland, put it that way. This is, this is going to be fantastic. So I have many, many projects. I've been active in the skeptic community for many years. And I was for a long time the kind of person who was in the audience listening I was the person who was listening to the podcasts, I was the person who was reading the books, I was the person who was reading the magazine articles, and for a very long time I was just very, just trying to find my niche. What is it I'm going to do because it's my time to step up and to make a difference. It was, it was, it was, it took a while to figure out what I was going to do. Um, I have many projects, so Mark will talk about some of the different things that he's involved in and that we are involved in together. Mark and I are both considered activists and the skeptical community. I'm more crowdsourced, at home, non-confrontational. Mark is completely the opposite. So uh, we do make a very good team. But I'm going to be talking to you about one project that I have, which is Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. I will refer to it as GSOW because that's just easier to say. But um, this is a project that was uh, inspired by a man named Tim Farley, who has a website called whatstheharm.net. And Tim Farley has a lot of great tools that he uses in the internet and the skeptic community. and. Um, with all the tools that are out there, we're able to use it for other kinds of things. Now, Wikipedia is not necessarily a skeptic, um, what the first thing that comes to mind for skeptics, but actually Wikipedia is one of the greatest instruments we have in the skeptical world because number one hit site. So anybody who's Googling anything or using any kind of search engine, they're going to hit uh, a Wikipedia page if a page exists. It's almost the first. Um, um, Thing that's going to come up first URL that will come up. So it's real important that our Wikipedia pages are in really, really great shape. So I normally start off with something that we have not done a lot on, but it's a very commonly hit page. 
So my first page, um, first thing I'm going to explain is homeopathy. This is my slide on homeopathy. Um, if somebody was to Google the word homeopathy, they're most likely going to get a Wikipedia page for homeopathy. And we have to, as a skeptic, as a group, we have to make sure that all the pages that somebody might be Googling are in terrific shape because it's our responsibility. Even though we are not, um, as I say, the, the, the people on Wikipedia who are editing aren't necessarily saying they're skeptics, almost all of them pretty much are. They want evidence, they want citations, um, and you know you have to back up everything you put on Wikipedia. Um, the homeopathy page, now obviously I'm going to go through these things fairly quickly, so I'm not going to have you sit here and read the pages. We're not going to do that kind of presentation. This is something you can look at whenever you get home or on your smartphones or whatever afterwards. But the homeopathy page is one of those pages that needs to be in really great shape because when somebody's Googling it and going to, to um, homeopathy to find out what it is or what kind of evidence there is for it, the first few paragraphs better say what it is in an easy to understand inf uh, way of, you know, just very quickly looking it over because most people aren't going to read the whole page. Yes, sir? Are you aware the screen is blank? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. That That's my homeopathy slide. That's the homeopathy slide. Yeah, there's, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. <laughs> nothing there. So, um, the, um, the GSOW team has not necessarily improved the homeopathy page. Maybe we've just looked at it a little bit because this is a well trafficked page. This is a page that, if you want to change the homeopathy page, it's very difficult to, to change because. Uh, there's so many editors who've got it exactly the way it should be. Homeopathy, astrology, Scientology, Mormonism, um, all those pages are in really terrific shape and you, it takes a lot to change something like that. But this is a really good example. Any ideas out there? How many people might even look at a homeopathy Wikipedia page in English? Too many. Too many, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any guesses what you think that gets hit? We know we can we can traffic we can see how many pay, people are viewing a Wikipedia page, but we can't um, know how long they've spent on the page or if it's the same person going back and forth. But we do know that the homeopathy page in English only last year hit one million three hundred and thirty-five thousand six hundred and two views. That's how many times that page was accessed and people were looking at it to some extent. So we know that people are interested in homeopathy. They want to know more about homeopathy. And on the lead of the homeopathy page, if you were to look at it, it would say something about placebos and not there's no evidence back it up and that kind of thing. So it's it's in really great shape. Okay, now the, the thing I'm gonna spend my most of my time talking to you about, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because I want to leave a lot of time for Mark. This is a project that we do that is extremely popular. It's the We Got to Wiki Back project. And <laughs> What we're trying to do is we're trying to improve the respectability of the people that that are our spokespeople. Because skeptics are skeptics in, you know, even if you don't appreciate or don't like that person in, or you don't feel that they represent uh, your blend of skepticism, they probably in the big picture, the world is looking at them and they're skeptics, you're skeptic, same thing. So in other words, we have to have their backs. We need to make sure that the Wikipedia pages for all our spokespeople are in terrific shape. Uh, we want them to look, uh, we want them to be readable with great photos on them. We don't want them to be something that looks like we don't care about that person. We want them to have some respectability. So I started this part of the GSOW, which is called the We Got Your Wiki Back. And I'm going to show you just a couple of examples of things we've, we've done before and after to give you some idea of what we do. So here's the first one. This is the Merseyside Skeptics. And I, again, I don't want you to read this. I want you to just look at it and see that this is the before page of what the Merseyside Skeptics Wikipedia page looked like before we became involved. So there was 13 citations and very few photos. <coughs> This is what it looks like now. My team rewrote this, and you can see that it looks 
it's more filling. It's more, uh, there's photos, there's more, there, here it is talking about homeopathy. But it's not an active activity of the engine. Yeah. <laughs> And I love this photo. Absolutely love psychic surgery. Just love that. So we so we selected that photo out of all the photos of, mm -hmm. that we could select from. This talks about the podcast. Talks about um, all kinds of different things. We wanted to make and there's a picture of Richard Dawkins because we wanted to make sure that anybody looking at the Mercy Side Skeptic page would see that you know we even attract somebody as much as like uh, Richard Dawkins. Look at this. Does this look respectable? Does this look like some page, if somebody's just glancing at it and doesn't know anything about skepticism? 45 citations, it's a beautifully <laughs> written page, nice photos, and it's engaging to read. It's not something that's just gonna be dry and boring and you're gonna fall asleep over. This is um, a photograph I thought might be kind of fun. It shows that when you click on the photos, you can see these are these photographers are, are people who are part of my group. Um, I often use photographs from outside of the group, you know, we'll go and find something, but I have people who actually work in our team that just goes out and, and takes photos for us. So this last QED, this is from 2013, and 2014 we'll have uh, more photographs that we've taken. I had them go and get all the different speakers' photographs. So that's Merseyside Skeptics. I did a little test, and I'm not sure if you guys know who Chris French is, but Chris French is a representative of the British um, and the, you know, you guys, UK people. And currently, well, before we got involved, the, his Wikipedia page had all sorts of flags on it. You can see these are bad citations saying that, you know, this page isn't in good shape. In other words, it was embarrassing. If we didn't have his back, if Chris French was in the news for anything, and people are going to look at his Wikipedia page. He doesn't look respectable. He doesn't look like anybody that that anybody should pay attention to. But now, and we have the Mercy Side Skeptics uh, photo up there, so that they would click on the Mercy Side Skeptic page. So it links from one page to another. You can see that now Chris French has a much more respectable page. He um, has a lot more citations. There's citations for Merseyside skeptics, as well as other places, the Scotsman, different kinds of stuff. Now he's up to 24 citations. So this is a real healthy Wikipedia page. It's giving a lot of respectability to somebody in our community. Okay. Ah, okay, okay let this run. I'm gonna just tell you a quick story. Because, um, so just ignore the screen for the moment. Nathan Phelps, you all know who Nathan Phelps is? Uh, you guys know who Westboro Baptist Church is in America? The, uh, we hate bags people. Okay, so I'm getting some nods now. Okay, Nathan Phelps is the son of Fred Phelps, who who uh, formed the Westboro Baptist Church. Nathan Phelps is also one of us. Um, he has uh, was just speaking at QED, and I met him. He's a wonderful person, absolutely a wonderful man. So. When I know, knew that I was going to be speaking at QED, we went through all the different speakers and we improved all their pages. I'm just showing you a very small percentage of them here today. And Nathan Phelps' page was not in very good shape, and you'll see that in a minute. And I assigned a, a I don't assign Wikipedia pages for people to improve, except when I'm training. And I had a brand new editor who, uh, who had been editing Wikipedia before, but he was kind of timid. He just said, you know, I'm really kind of not sure about this kind of stuff and, you know, give me a nice easy page to work on. And I gave him Nate Phelps. I said, I want this thing rewritten. I need it rewritten before QED. And so we went back and forth on it. We have a forum where all of our editors are at so we can discuss and interact with each other all uh, on discuss how the page should be so that we can, we can improve each other and give lots of feedback. So we're going back and forth about Nate Phelps' page and we're talking about different things. And then one night, it was almost done, I saw on Facebook that Nate Phelps had said that his father, Fred Phelps, the founder of the Westboro Baptist Church, is in hospice and he's near death. And I'm like, oh my God, this is gonna be massive. So I'm like, publish it, publish it, publish it. So this poor editor, he's like, oh my God, oh my God. He said he, he said he felt so nervous publishing that page. And I said, that's power. 
What you've just done is you've just made a difference, a massive difference. And I'll show you right now. Here's, here's how it works. So here's Nathan Phelps' page before we got involved. And you can see that it's not got the best photo on it, but again, we published it right before it was ready to be released. So not an awful page. We see way worse than this. The Nathan Phelps doesn't look very respectable, sort of a little bit, seven citations, you know. Uh, people are gonna go, oh, okay, that's nice. So here's Nathan Phelps' page now after we published that night. And we went through quite a bit. And when you do get a chance to read this, I'm hoping that you're gonna be engaged and that you're gonna click on the other links and find you know more things to read and you find that we even have criticism on there because we're, we're, we really try to make sure we have stuff like that. Um, now he has 31 views, uh, 31 citations, which is great. It's a nice, strong page. So what we did is we went to Fred Phelps' page, his father, and we made sure Nathan was mentioned on his father's page quite a bit. So that way, when so you can see how Nathan's mentioned several times, so that way we would be able to people reading Fred Phelps' page, because we figured that people were going to read about Fred Phelps once he dies, and that they would go and they would find Nathan's page. And here on Westboro Baptist Church, we also put links for Nathan on the Westboro Baptist page. In a second here, I'm going to show you the stats. Um, so all these links will get people interested in finding the, uh, the Nathan's page. We also have on here him at Metha who is the Friendly Atheist. We, we wrote his Wikipedia page just very recently. We just launched that, so we like having that on there. It's pretty cool. Now here's the stats, which you're gonna see, as soon as I click on it, click, there you go. Here's Nathan Phelps' page views for the month. Now he was getting about, let me look him up here in a second, 135 views a day, Nathan Phelps. Nobody hardly heard of him at all. Here's where he announced that his father was in hospice, 5,000 views. The next day, 14,000 views, and so on. And then here's whenever Fred Phelps was in the news for death, when he actually died, and you can see all these stats. So all of a sudden, so Nate Phelps is in the news because Fred Phelps is in the news, and Nathan Phelps is, is as I said, one of us. He's run CFI Canada. Uh, organization. You can see here his stats still were up in the 300s way after his father's died, so he's still in the news. So um, here's Fred Phelps' page. He was receiving, he received over 600,000 views the month that his, of his death. He's normally received about 800 views a day. Hope I don't bog you down with too many numbers, but it's kind of a visual thing. You can see almost nothing. And then here he's in hospice, and here he's getting 127,000 views when he died. And all those views are funneling them over to Nate Phelps and our uh, skeptic organizations and, and so on. Here's the Westboro Baptist Church, same thing. This major spike on Wikipedia. So we got the page rewritten just in time. I had no idea that Fred Phelps' was health was that bad. I had no clue. But we were able to do this in time to make the world who's looking at our us Make them go and say, wow, what's the skepticism thing? Who is this Nate Phelps? What is a uh, center for inquiry? What is the skepticism movement? And if I had the time, I could probably see if after Nate Phelps' pages hit, if there's a ripple effect and even more pages are, are affected as we go. So I'm going to show you one more thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really holding out for questions because that's what I like, the question and answer part of the best. This is one more person that we did for the QED, and I don't know if you know who he is or not. And it's not QED. There we are. Mark Crispin. I don't know if you guys know who this is. He's a podcaster. He does a medical podcast. This is called a non-scroller, because you don't have to scroll to see the page. It was so bad and stuff. <laughs> so we've got a new photo. Um, you won't be able to see this on your smartphones, but we've also made a, we have a new project where we're getting audio from all the people that we're writing the pages for, so that it gives more personality to the to the um, to the page. And Mark is hilarious. I had no idea. So this is one of our one of our representatives. 
in the skeptical community. He's a podcaster. He blogs. He does uh, science-based um, medicine kind of stuff. So that gives you an example. And I have one more example. I don't know if you guys are aware. I love doing newspapers. I love paper. I don't know if you guys saw these headlines today. Um, apparently, there's a problem with your David Cameron is... Uh, <laughs> he's not ours. He's not ours, okay. In America, this is all... I know you guys are really divided, but in America, we see you all as one. I'm so sorry to tell you that, but just giving you the American view. Um, he came out today, talk, or this weekend, talking about uh, the Britain is a Christian country, and people were quite upset about that, which we were, I was very happy to see. And they're blaming America on his, because <laughs> that is quite American for our uh, Congress people to, or our, our political leaders to constantly talk about their uh, religious beliefs, Christianity. And I guess that's very unusual over here. But, so I was reading this on the train, and I was looking this over, and I noticed that there was a whole bunch of people in the science community that wrote a letter. Do you guys know what I'm talking about this? Okay. Yeah. They wrote a letter to, um, the yeah, the tel yeah, they sent it to the newspaper, the Telegraph, uh, and they said that, you know, they weren't, they weren't okay with this. And some of the people on there were, well, at least one name I recognized. <coughs> and hopefully you guys all recognize it too, but I was reading this through and Simon Singh signed that. You guys know who Simon Singh is, right? So I was looking at this, I'm like, Simon Singh? That is so cool. That's one of our people. I mean, I know him. That's, that's really cool. So what, what I'm trying to do is, now, how do I get out of the Sterling? Escape. Escape! <laughs> Other side. <laughs> okay, now how do I get over to, is this going to pull it up? Simon Singh. Okay, so if you, if I talk with my back to you, you'll see. So here's Simon Singh. So I look to see, now we have done a little tiny bit with this page, mainly with the photographs on here. But what, what GSOW is trying to do with the We Got Your Wiki Back project is, we don't know when the next person in our community is going to receive instant fame, you know, and it may be bad fame, it may be good fame, we don't know. But we need to make sure the Wikipedia page is ready because people are going to Google these people's names and they're going to find these pages and then they need to, once they find these pages, then they're going to find out about our community, Mercy Side Skeptic Society. So somebody's going to go, who in the heck, what is that, Mercy Side? I've heard of that. And then they're going to go to these pages. By the way, we just finished publishing the Edinburgh Skeptics uh, uh, Wikipedia page just a week or so ago, but I haven't had a chance to blog about it and I don't have it on the screen. But the Edinburgh uh, Skeptic Society has a brand new Wikipedia page. It's beautiful. So make sure you get a chance to look at that. But I don't have it. But here's the Simon Singh. So this is what people are going to see whenever they um, Google Simon Singh in the next few days. And you can see the different, um, how we've had quite a bit of skepticism in here. Here's Tam. It's Tam London. Here's the chiropractic lawsuit and so on. But you can see that he's very well respected. I would think that if somebody pulled up this Wikipedia page and wanted to know who Simon Singh is, they're going to find that he's probably a pretty respectable person. But this is what GSOW does is what I would have is one of my new editors, is, I'm going to make them go in, they're going to find um, articles about the Simon Singh signing this, this document, this letter, with all these other notable people, and then they're going to make sure it gets into Simon Singh's Wikipedia page to give him more notability, more respectability, and so on. So um, I, think, I think I'm done. We're going to take questions after Mark has spoken. I have no idea if I'm giving you enough information to even have a clue what we're doing, but I'm always recruiting people to join uh, my project. Um, I'm now giving my contact information if you want that, but we, what I do is skeptical activism. This is just one of several projects I have, but this is skeptical activism. We train people how to be editors. People come in and sometimes all they do is proofread. Some people just come in and do photos and different kinds of things like that. But I train, recruit, 
uh, you know, totally mentor our people who come in. So I would love to have some people here say, I, I want to do this. I want to do this, Susan. Show me how. You can do it totally at home with um, a cat or two or a dog in the nude. I don't care. I don't want to know. But it, 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 it's a kind of project that's activism because you're getting beyond the choir. You're getting out there and making such a difference. The only other thing um, I wanted to mention besides the sign and sing is we were talking about this community. I was just over here at your Dundee Museum um, just a few hours ago and I took a photo of a um, sign that they had on there saying how religion has is totally decreased in, in Dundee over the years with the exception of and I had some church what was the like Gate, Life, Gate, Life Gate Church and then on the car drive over she was telling me that they're an anti-vax group so I don't know how big of a deal that is over here in uh, Dundee but this is the kind of thing that you would that would hit home here they don't have a Wikipedia page this church maybe they should have a Wikipedia page and maybe they should have a Wikipedia page with a lot of criticism on it that really explains what it is they're doing and the anti-vax views and so on and that page needs to be written in other languages because GSOW writes pages in all kinds of languages after the page is written in, in English really well, then we translate it into many, many other languages. So as we were talking, she was telling me that um, a lot of Romanians... I have heard about Eastern Europeans in general. Right. They come to Dundee. They, don't, they are approached by this church. And so if the Wikipedia page was written in that language, it may have more influence and more... Um, you know, might impact them more if it's written in their own language. So that's another thing that we do a lot in uh, GSOW. So I'm going to pause. Are you going to show the, vid the rest of the video now that's buffered? And oh. then let Mark talk? So we can do, do that. We can do the video as a wee quick break because the video is about three and a bit minutes long. So if people want to quickly this read This is the video that, that was shown so. at the beginning of QED. It's quite fun as you've already started to see. So. Yeah, I think. And I'll be at the back. Does anybody know what QED is? <laughs> it's the big. That's why. That's who brought us here. The QED is the big uh, conference that's held in Manchester each year, and Mark and I were hired and sent from California to come lecture for it. And you guys have got to go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what I've, does QED stand for? Question. question. Explore, Explore, discover. And QED is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Mark and I and Sterling have attended the the amazing meeting in Las Vegas every year for like the last eight years with the James Randi Foundation. And this is just a smaller version of it, much better run. He's, he's okay. All right. So I'm going to go to the back. I'm going to go to the back. Tangents. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to go off on tangents. So what we'll do is we'll show that video very briefly. Um, but first of all, just a quick round of applause for Susan. come back and revisit later on. I'm sure Susan's talking and we can, we can get questions and some opinions from you guys in the audience. Right. We'll okay, now it's my turn. Oh, okay. well, so I just have one question for Sterling. Where are you, Sterling? Yeah. So if I want to show the Sylvia Brown thing, do we have to buffer it and load it and all that? Get that started. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Edward and uh, I'm a part of the skeptic movement. I have been since around 1970, somewhere in there. I started by, uh, I'm a magician by profession, and I also, I got into mentalism as an offshoot of magic. So my grandfather was a magician, I studied magic for a long, long time. Got kind of bored with it because around the 70s, this guy named Uri Geller came along and came out to California and went to the Stanford in Institute and convinced a lot of science, uh, science people that he could bend metal with his mind. So for me, that was a sea change in magic, <coughs> really, because a lot of magicians at the time were like, what is going on? This is, he, he took silverware to a whole new level for everybody, okay? And, and of course, as magicians, we wanted to know what the secret was. So I started getting involved with the skeptic movement then. Uh, my career in magic, I'm just giving a little background, uh, went along fairly nicely, made a living with it, but I just, it wasn't enough for me. Magic by itself, a lot of it just seems to have, have or at the time, it had no meaning for me. Uh, if, if you take a red handkerchief, show you a red handkerchief and, 
I push it through my hand and a green handkerchief comes out, you know. Other than clever and pretty to look at, it has no meaning. So mentalism is a branch of magic where you use the five senses to create the illusion of a sixth, ESP, telekinesis, uh, predictions, all these things that seem to be, we're drawn to on a whole different level than just eye candy. Okay, so I love all forms of magic, but for me, mentalism was what really took off. So, I don't know if you've heard of the Magic Castle, but I worked at the Magic Castle for 14 years in their seance room, okay? So a seance is a whole different bag of tricks. It's, uh, if it's done correctly, and this is my opinion, again, in my experience, if it's done correctly at the end of the seance, people, if they applaud at the end of my seance, then I haven't done a very good job, okay? For me, my seance at the end, I want them with their jaws on the table, <laughs> sweating, just completely blown away, like a roller coaster ride. So, of course, in this, in this arena of performance art, which it really is, it's a performance art, magic is an art, but a seance is a play, it's like a mini play, you have, you're a storyteller. So, that's when I started to be interested in this whole psychic thing, okay? Because I would see psychics on the television, or I would hear about them, and I would actually go see them. And I would see that they're performance artists, okay? They, they, I didn't see any real skill other than uh, verbal deception and some body language traits and some NLP and a lot of psychological things that magicians study for audience behavior were being turned around and kind of used in a, in a very... Uh, shall I say, supernatural way. So, always being attracted to the supernatural as a magician, that's been my area of study. So, my thing is activism because I'm a street performer. I did street magic. I'm not afraid to get out of, in front of people and technically make a fool out of myself, okay? I am not afraid to confront people. Susan's thing is totally different. Like she said, Susan's activism she can do that in her pajamas at home. She never has to leave the house, and she's been incredibly effective. For me, I want to get out on the street, and I want to, I want to let, let the psychics know, and again, I'm going to elaborate on that, that there are people out there who are on to what they're doing. Okay? So we are totally different areas, but we, we work together because Susan's involved in what I do, and I'm more or less involved in what she does. Uh, so activism, guerrilla skepticism, you might wonder where that came from, okay? So I grew up in the 60s, and uh, we had the Vietnam War. You all remember that, don't you? <laughs> Some of you might have heard of it. Uh, you know, they, we had guerrilla warfare in Vietnam, which was huge. It was, it was secretive. It was stealthy. It was underground. It was, it was insurgency. It was effective. Okay, talk to any Vietnam vet, they'll tell you the, one of the biggest problems was guerrilla warfare. So I had this idea about six years ago, guerrilla skepticism. It's more militant, yes, it is more in your face, but it is a branch that in America, I think we really need. Because, and this is part of the difference that since we talked to QED, I have found out about. You know, in America, we have all the religious thing is just so out of control. And they are in your face. They are in your face. They are shooting, you know, uh, people who perform abortions. They are the West, Westboro Baptist Church. All this stuff is just completely rampant, okay? So my whole thing is fight fire with fire, okay? And as a magician, it takes a thief to catch a thief. So, what I did in, in about 1997, I decided I was going to, uh, there were all these businesses, there were the 900 telephone lines, they were huge, they were making millions of dollars. And they sent me a letter one day, and the letter said, we're looking for the world's greatest psychic. So I said, look no further, okay? <laughs> I decided I was gonna make it my business to infiltrate, okay? You can't, you can't just go into a psychic or a spiritualist church and say, show me how you do this. They, won't, they, they will just say, oh, well, you must have years of 
theology and you must, you know, meditate, you know, I mean, no, to learn how to do fake psychic stuff, you just have to learn how to lie effectively, okay? I mean, and fake psychic is an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a psychic. And I've searched for it for almost 35 years. Sorry if you're a believer, it doesn't work, okay? So what I did is I decided I was going to climb to the top of this mountain, this dung hill, it was the psychic industry in America, and see how far I could get by scamming the scammers. So I learned a lot, and, and in my travels, it became a fascinating thing to do. I played a double agent. I went into situations where I played the role of a psychic, and I humbled, I humbled myself to some of the biggest charlatans I've ever met in my whole life, okay? And by humbling myself to them, they opened up to me this whole wink, wink, nod, nod of business, okay? So it's like being in the carnival business. In the carnival business, there's a term called with it, okay? With it means you're on the inside track. You know how the wheel is rigged. You know how, uh, how the th certain props are weighted to scam people, okay? You're with it. Well, it's a wink, wink, nod thing that I learned. Again, this is in my experience. I want to make that clear, okay? In my experience, it's 80 to 90% of these people who are out there saying they're talking to dead people are complete charlatans. Now, when you're at, you may be thinking the other 10%. Maybe there's 8% who are deluded, who are have had some sort of experience in their life that has convinced them that they have this ability. So they're not actively cheating and scamming. And then maybe there's one to five percent of the people who may actually be helping people. But it's very small in my experience. So I wrote this book called Psychic Blues. Okay? So Psychic Blues is my experiences in this world. You can get it on Amazon, Mark Edwards, Psychic Blues. I sold out of every copy of QED, so I don't have any with me tonight. I wish I did. It's, it, it's written as a dark comedy. It's a novel. It's not a debunking book, because what I realized, uh, James Randi wrote the introduction for it, okay? Because he's a dear friend of mine. What I realized is if I wrote just another debunking book, you know, if I just told all these secrets, the audience for a debunking book is about as big as this group compared to a New Age convention. Do I need to tell you the difference? Okay, we are highly outnumbered. So my goal as a magician and a performer and a mentalist has always been to try and reach the greatest amount of people possible. So that's why I'm into this whole skeptical activism thing, because for us to reach beyond the choir is the big challenge. I, I even liken it to a spiritual movement. I know that may sound a little heavy, but it's up to us to take what we know and what we're involved in to another level, okay? So for me, that's how I did it. As I said, I am going to share this information in a novel. So it's gotten very good reviews. Not necessarily from the skeptics, because the skeptics, some of them don't understand that how could you do that? You know, how could you put yourself in that you made money giving fortune telling readings? Yes, I did, okay? But the whole time I was studying and I was also giving back some skepticism. I try to inject skepticism, even in my mentalism act. You know, I will try and get people to say, you don't really believe I was talking to a dead person there, okay? So it's been a tenuous bind for many years, but now I think I'm thoroughly, I'm thoroughly uh, immersed in the skeptic, skeptic movement, and I'm gaining their respect. But for a while, I, it was like I was walking this tightrope. Psychics hated me, skeptics hated me, <laughs> magicians were like, "What are you doing?" So the important thing is to do something. All right, that's what really got me going. Is I and, and one of the things I said at QED is. One of the things I really don't like that I cannot stand to do in my life at, at this point is sit and listen to someone talk about what to do. <laughs> so forgive me because, you know, that's, I, I, the only way I can get my message to you is to try and tell you how to get up out of your seats and do something, okay? In my blog at Skeptic Blog, 
Uh, I, that's what I say repeatedly. Do something. Stop thinking. Stop listening. You already have enough information. Now you need to do something. Now, what you do, I'm not advocating doing anything to break any laws, okay? I want to make that clear because I know you have these incredible libel laws here in this country that we don't have in America. I can go to Sylvia Brown. Is it loading? Yeah. It's what? It's loading. Okay. I can go to, I could go, I went to Sylvia Brown's <laughs> performances and I stood out on the street and I handed out flyers that told cold reading techniques and I handed out a list of all the most egregious names of the people that she was so horribly wrong about. She told parents of murdered children that their children were still alive or she told people that they were alive when they were dead. Did I get that right? So, I mean, this woman was never right, and she, she caused so much grief, we call them grief vampires, that we, we put those names down, we made about five or six hundred of them, we handed them out, we stood on the street, we had a blast. Because it bonded people like us together, for one, it was fun, you really felt, what we really felt when we left like we had made a difference, and I know we did, because Sylvia Brown never came back to Las Vegas, okay? And when I did, I punked Sylvia Brown at the Universal Amphitheater in Hollywood. You can see that at my website, themarkedward.com. Look at the punk Universal Amphitheater videotape. I won't go into it. It was very effective. Uh, she never came back to Hollywood after that. Chip Coffee, you all know who Chip Coffee is? I'm mentioning names. I probably shouldn't. Okay, I'll stop. Anyway, we go after these people. And I want to make another thing clear. It, we're not trying to change the minds of the audience. That's very important, okay? <coughs> They've already made up their minds. They've paid for their ticket. Okay, they might change their minds when they take the name, the list of names, and go on and Google and see where that leads them, okay? But to try and disrupt the performance is a total waste of time. You're wasting your time, and you're liable to get thrown out. And I've been thrown out. It's a terrible feeling, you know, to be escorted to the door of a hotel and told by the person, don't come back. And when this happened to me, I stood out on the street for a couple minutes and I felt kind of bad. But then I said, wait a minute, you did the right thing. Because now this person who was up on the stage knows that we're out there. And I won't mention any names again, but I know from that experience that we freaked him out. We made him very nervous. What should have been the opening night of his book tour where he should have been very happy and drinking champagne and getting patted on the back, he was terrified. And we saw his face and he knew we were there and we knew that he knew that we were there. <laughs> so it was incredibly effective. It's not about the audience. It's about getting to the person on the stage. So they start to think, maybe I'm not going to be able to get away with this like I used to. And believe me, they are getting away with murder. Uh, I don't know if you all know Doc Shields. Ever hear of Doc Shields here in Scotland? He's down in Ireland. He did the original. He's a hoaxer. And he's a, a magician. And he did the original Loch Ness photos. So, you know, his whole thing is, Magic is what you can get away with, okay? And we, I personally believe that we are now in the golden age of the con, right now, okay? If you look back at the spiritualist movement, if you thought that was bad, you know, with the people taking advantage of the children who, were, who died in a war, and they were the, the people would come to the medium to try and get in touch with their dead children, it has gone to a whole new level now. And so we are, from my studies, we are in the biggest shell game of all. Okay, and I won't get into all the conspiracy theories about the banks and everything else, but it's just bad enough with just the psychics, okay, and the mediums and all this fraudulent activity that's going on. So, I know Sally Morgan was right down the street, okay? Did anyone do anything? Sorry, I would have been there. I'm going to throw like a, like a mustache. <laughs> yeah, anything, anything you 
can do. And I want to mention this because this is something I said at QED. Even if you buy a ticket which goes against everything you, you would ever want to do and laugh at her, okay? If you go to her show and you just, she makes a really stupid cold reading mistake where she tries to turn something around. You all know about cold reading, right? I don't have to demonstrate it for you, do I? Don't make me go there. <laughs> the point is, if, if she makes some really egregious error, ah, ha, 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 you laugh. Watch her face. Watch her handlers. They're just going to be like, but there's nothing they can do. It's, it's Heckling's a lot. Well, no, heckling is different. Heckling would be if I said, you're a phony, you know, you, you don't have any credibility, get off the stage. That's heckling. Laughter can be taken a lot of different ways by her. See, it's her you want to get to. You want to laugh at these mistakes. And I've seen other people who've gone to other shows who have used this laughter or just, they just guffaw, you know, at the stupidity of things that the, the site will say. But anyway, <laughs> activism is where I am at. I, I, I don't get to do it as much as I would like to. Because a lot of times, like at Dragon Con and, and QED, I'm again talking to people. I hate doing this, but this is the only way we can, Susan and I can get our message out there, other than if you go to our website, so you look at our YouTube videos, you can see what we're actually doing out there. And we know we're making a difference. Uh, we had somebody who, when Sylvia Brown was, after I did the Universal Amphitheater thing, she defected from Sylvia's camp, meaning she was working for Sylvia Brown, but she decided, see, somebody's laughing. <laughs> see how it just, it undoes, it, it undoes an audience. You're, you're all tied up in this psychic knot, and somebody laughs, and it just, it's like, it's contagious. You're like, well, why are we listening to this ridiculousness? So anyway, Sylvia Brown, somebody defected from her camp, and we were kind of wondering, well, you know, it went off pretty well, but I wonder what really happened. She told us that she was really pissed off. She was like, who is that guy? What happened? Uh, should I tell just a little bit of what happened? Yeah, tell it quickly. I'm sure okay, very quick, because you can see the video. The video is a little unclear because we got a hidden camera. We take hidden cameras in, okay? And we tape this to get, to get the then we, we take the tape and we, we uh, uh, transcribe it, and it's amazing. Like, some of these people ask, like, uh, uh, the Long Island Psychic, you know her, you get her over here? Uh, Yay, Teresa you. Caputo, you don't have Teresa Caputo? Oh my god. That's 40 questions in like three minutes. You know, if you're a psychic, if you were really in touch with this other world, you just know. You don't have to ask a question. You don't have to say, does that mean anything to anybody? You would know, okay? And so 40, 50 questions in three minutes. It's, it's unbelievable. So what, basically what I did at Sylvia Brown is I had five or six names of these murdered children, people that she had like, like told, like the Sago mine disaster. You remember that? She said all these miners were dead. <laughs> they weren't all dead. No, she said they were alive. Oh, she said they were alive. That's right. Yeah. So, so I mean, just really, just awful stuff. Uh, so I made this list, and you ha she has this little line. You get to go up to a microphone and ask her a question, and, and it's like a sausage factory. I mean, she's just, she's like sitting with Montel Williams is sitting next to her, and people are coming up. What's my spirit guide's name? <laughs> His name is Phil. Next. <laughs> <laughs> and the person, is my boyfriend true to me? No, I'm sorry, honey. He's not true to you. Next. It's just, you can't believe that people will watch it. And she's got this croggy part. She had this croggy voice. So I got in line, and I had in my mind this piece of theater I was going to do. So I got up to her. I said, Sylvia, I keep hearing these, these voices in my head. And, and they're names of people. And I started naming them. Opal Joe Jennings. Uh, Blah, blah, blah. I start naming them. They're talking to me and they're telling me, you know, that you were wrong. So <laughs> I, I forget exactly what I said, but I mean, Montel was like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, they're talking to me, they're telling me right now, you know, 
you lie, you know, you, it's not right what, you, what you've done. They're trying to speak to me. So I went into this whole thing, and I mean, just 450 people in this audience. So then I did a classic uh, Nightmare Alley. How many people here have seen the movie Nightmare Alley? Oh, well, check it out. It's a great movie about a fake, fake uh, medium. So uh, then I passed out, and I took the microphone with me. So I just <laughs> passed out on the floor. Like I had had a, a seizure of some kind. All right, now I'm laying on the floor, and here's this line of people. <laughs> Do you think she said anything? Like, is this man all right? Is he okay? They were <laughs> stepping over me. <laughs> They're going like this. They're going. Okay, Sylvia, I would like to ask. I'm lying there. <laughs> so, and I, I decided, you know, when you play this game, I do it in the seance room lie there until somebody does something you know so five seconds laying on a stage like that is a long time that's 10 seconds is really a long time I think I probably laid there for maybe 15 seconds and nobody came to see if I was all right or anything so do you think that says something to the audience about Sylvia Brown she didn't say anything because she knew that I knew that she knew that I knew. And she's not going to say anything. She, what did she say? They're your spirit guides. And I said, no, they're not my spirit guides. They're dead. They're, you know. So she tried to wriggle out of it. So I laid there. Finally, her son, who basically we've heard is now going to take over for mom, Chris, he comes down there and he says, are you all right? He said, yeah, I'm okay. So they slowly took me backstage. Now the topper of this story, which I have to tell. So they take me off the stage and I'm like, people are going, who is that guy? What's wrong with him? You know, but they were already, she just kept going. Kept going like nothing had happened. So they take me backstage at the Universal Amphitheater and they have an EMP, you know, who's on call for this sort of thing. And she comes rushing in and she opens her box and she's like, are you all right? Are you all right? She takes my blood pressure. She says, blood pressure is okay. Uh, you got a temperature? No. Uh, heart rate is okay. I, I don't see anything wrong. Right? <laughs> so I'm playing it to, for as long as I can, trying to figure out, now what am I going to do? So as a mentalist, you have to dance a little bit. You have to, like, no, you know, kind of fake it if you have to. So I was like, oh, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Then she brings out this form. It's a legal form that she has to fill out because she's an emergency person. She starts asking me my name and address. Then I realized, okay, can't go there because they're, they're liable to, Sylvia will get this information. And I was like, no, I'm not going to let that happen. So now comes the crux of the issue that we are presented with in the movement we are in. The woman says to me, oh, and I explained to her, I say, we're skeptics, we're, uh, we're anti-psychics, we're trying to call this person out on stage. I made that whole up, the whole thing up. I really didn't pass out. I, you know, I don't, we don't like her. This was all an act just to try and get to her. And she's like going, yeah, yeah. Now this is a doctor, right? And I say, okay, so we're going to go now. And she goes, wait, 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 one more thing before you go. And I said, what? And she says, is my boyfriend ever going to get a good job? <laughs> So, okay, that's what we're up against, okay? So, can you, this is why we are, we are more aggressive. We have to be aggressive with what we do. We did a thing for the, uh, end, what was the end of the world guys oh, thing? The Harold Camping. Harold Camping, where he said it was going to be the end of the world and the rapture was going to happen. We were there on Hollywood Boulevard and we counted it down. We counted it down, and we all we had signs like, "When the rapture comes, can I have your car?" You know, and we're going up. And we're going, hey, it's going to happen in two minutes. Are you going to be here? Are you going? Or if you're going, I'll I'll take your house. And you know, we had like 25 people. It was on the hilarious. Street. So it's now I'm going to run the Sylvia Brown. This was in Las Vegas. This was. Uh, it turned out we did Tam in Las Vegas. And five miles away, Sylvia Brown was going to be at this theater. So the thing you're going to see is a bunch of us 
And, and we asked, I asked the people at QED, how long do you think it took us to get this together? People were going, a month, two months. It took, took us four hours to put this whole thing together. So this is the kind of activism I do, and I hope you enjoy it. May not be for everybody, but... <laughs> Oh, screen, screen. Screen. Yeah. Oh, Are you going to see Sylvia Brown? Yeah, you're going to see Sylvia Brown! Yeah. 